Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome again to the uh, 2022 International Open Seminar on uh, Semiotics. This is a tribute to John Dealey on the fifth anniversary of his passing. And today's lecture is going to be our third overall lecture, but it will be the second lecture in the historical module. And we also have a, um, um, a uh, what's the other module? <laughs> Somebody help me out here. Um, I can't think of the name. Anyway, uh, today is uh, delivered by uh, the, the presentation is gonna be Dr. Paniel Reyes Cardenas, and I'm gonna be introducing him momentarily. Uh, the title of this talk is Dun Scotus on Signs, Common Nature, Hexeity, and Signification. So I'm really excited to hear about about this. Uh, Dun Scotus is not necessarily one of the first names that comes up when you think about signs, but uh, so we're gonna be treated here, I think. So we'd, we'd like to thank Dr. Cardenas for accepting the invitation. After the lecture, anyone participating here at the Zoom uh, meeting will, will be asked or invited to share any comments or questions they may have or any insights they'd like to add. And uh, so now let me, uh, allow me to uh, offer a brief introduction to Dr. Cardenas. So Dr. Cardenas was awarded his uh, master's in uh, philosophy and his doctorate in philosophy at the uh, University of Sheffield, UK. His PhD thesis, uh, he researched the place of scholastic realism in Peirce's pragmatist philosophy. And although uh, Paniel's approach is centered on the pragmatist tradition, he also has a wide range of philosophical interest. He's published papers on the philosoph uh, philosophy of mathematics, metaphysics, medieval philosophy, philosophy of religion, and German idealism. Dr. Cardenas has participated in academic conferences in many different countries, and he's also the founder of the Peirce Latin American Society. So after a spell as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Nottingham, Paniel accept, uh, joined as a lecturer in research at the UPAEP, which is the People's Autonomous University of Puebla, State Puebla, Mexico, where he is the chair of philosophy and language, I'm sorry, philosophy of language and medieval philosophy. Uh, he's part of the Mexican Council of Science and Technology and is the author of two scholarly books, Scholastic Realism, a key to understanding Peirce's philosophy and as well as ideas and development, which is a collection of essays on the history of philosophy. So with that, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Paniel Reyes Cardenas. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate your really kind uh, introduction. Um, just let me figure out um, how to share my screen right as of now. I think it should be, is it, is it visible now for use? Not, not. Not yet? Okay, I'll try again. Okay, let me have a look. Is that all right now? It is, Professor. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, you'll be seeing me coming in and out of the shadows because I'm in a kind of funny desk lamp. Uh, um, so that will only mean that I'm coming from, from ignorance to, <laughs> to, to the light of truth, as, as, as Scotus would like to put it. Um, thank you, Tim, uh, for... Uh, I'm just going to kickstart with a word of thanks. Um, I thank you, Tim, for the really kind introduction. And thank you, Robert, and all the committee of... Uh, Professor Dipti and all the committee from Robert Junqueira and all the committee from the International Open Seminar in honor of John Dilley. I, I feel very, very honored to be part of this. Um, I was really pleasantly surprised by the invitation. Uh, so I, 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 I hope this talk is going to be the beginning of a fruitful uh, you know, relationship with, with the seminar, which I, I really feel very happy to be part of. Um, uh, so what I prepare for you today is a talk uh, that is gonna take around an hour or so, more or less. Um, 
and hopefully I'll, I'll give space for comments, questions, and uh, corrections, everything you like. Um, so um, at the moment, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm broadcasting this. Well, we're calling from, I'm calling from San Antonio, Texas, where, where I'm a visiting professor at the Oblit School of Theology. And I just want to say a word of thanks also for the college to giving me the opportunity to have this year um, doing research. And one of the one of the hopefully one of the outcomes of this year is going to be a book on medieval Franciscan scholasticism, which hopefully will be published by the end of this year. And another outcome it will be an, a study of of of, of uh, Josiah Royce's uh, semiotic theory of community. So, um, kind of um, so this talk is going to be some kind of a middle point between the two things. I hope you find it interesting. So um, just like Tim said at the beginning, Dooms's code does, doesn't seem to be um, the, the most immediate figure that you associate to the history of semiotics. But what I'm, the, 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 the thesis I want to defend here is that actually the metaphysics that Dooms's code um, proposed, the, the, his Aristotelian fashion of metaphysics, uh, is going to be a key, um, a very important key for the development of Persian semiotics. So this is, I think this is a kind of, in, in some ways, a novel thesis I want to explore with you. But, but, but I hope, um, you know, during the talk, you, you'll see, you'll get to see um, how this development of, of, of Scotus's metaphysics, it will be um, a crucial it will be a crucial contribution to the history of semiotics. Uh, so that's that's my hope. And of course, um, during the talk, we'll we'll clarify some of these terms like common nature, hexaity, which sounds like probably a bit um, people not familiar with medieval philosophy find those terms a little bit difficult to, to grasp with. But um, but don't worry, bear with me. <laughs> we'll we'll try to clarify as much as possible these different terms. And of course, uh, Scotus's theory of signification is also going to be an important key to understand what we, to understanding what we want to uh, achieve here. Okay. So the outline of our talk today is going to be, we're going to, we're going to um, flesh out, uh, and we're going to try to, to, spell out uh, Scotus's metaphysics, particularly what I think is, is the key contribution that is gonna help us, which is his metaphysics of universals. Um, another aspect of this metaphysics of, or this proposal, this realism of universals that Scotus has uh, defended, and that, for example, people like Charles and the Spurs appreciated um, as a key to understand his own philosophy, um, like I, like I defend, <laughs> bear with me and forgive me for a little bit of shameful, <laughs> shameless uh, self-advertising, but in this book, Scholastic Realism, I, uh, which is the outcome of, of my PhD thesis um, made into a book. Um, so what I try to defend is exactly that, that, that Scotus provided pairs of the necessary, um, the necessary um, metaphysical ammunition <laughs> in order to defend his realist, semiotic realism. So that's that's an important claim I want to defend here. And in order to get to that, one of the uh, um, one of the key interesting bits that we're gonna make a comment on is that uh, medieval philosophers particularly um, um, medieval scholastics, um, which is gonna be important to make that distinction because there are other philosophers before the emerging of the universities in, in, in uh, Western Europe, but actually um, it was scholasticism, you know, the professionalization of philosophy, theology, and, 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 and humanities in general, um, that allowed um, the necessary development uh, of a distinction. Um, and particularly it was due to um, the rediscovery of Aristotle, 
um, there was an, an important Arabic philosopher that was a, a very important key for the understanding of, um, of Aristotelian philosophy for medieval European scholastics like Duns Scotus, Thomas Aquinas, Henry of Kent, and others. And of course, uh, John Dilley's favorite, uh, John Poinsot. <laughs> uh, we couldn't talk about that too, because I think John Dilley, um, you know, we want to honor his thought here. And I think he has a lot of fascinating things to say about the development of semiotics. But um, um, we will see here that this development of medieval philosophy came up with a distinction that is gonna be key uh, to understand uh, semiotics even nowadays, which is um, a metaphysics of most being um, articulated with a semiotics of modes of signification. So uh, modes of being and modes of signification are gonna be two key aspects that are gonna um, trigger uh, Perse's, own, Perse's own semiotics. And, and I think the most important uh, and, um, contribution uh, that led Perse to this was is present in Duns Scotus. Um, then we will, we will review what Scotus himself says about signs. And like John Dilley says, um, we will find that to some extent, uh, Duns Scotus is, is kind of borrowing on the ideas of, um, uh, of Roger Bacon, another Franciscan philosopher of the Middle Ages, uh, contemporary Thomas Aquinas. Um, this is, this is going to be very interesting as well, but it will not be as important as understanding what actually Scotus says on signification. Um, we, we will establish a distinction between science and signification that will help us to understand his, his contribution a little bit better. So let's say a little bit about John Duns Scotus himself. John Duns Scotus was a Franciscan, commonly called John Duns, which was um, OFM, which is Order, Order of Friars Minor, also known as Franciscans is commonly called Duns Scotus, Duns the Scot, the Scot or the Scottish, uh, was a Scottish Franciscan friar. He was a university professor, a philosopher and a theologian. Duns, Scot, Duns Scotus was given the scholastic accolade Doctor Subtilis, which means uh, a subtle doctor for his penetrating and subtle manner of thought. Um, if we, we could classify Duns Scotus on, on, on this um, genera, genera of um, forgotten geniuses. I think it's my opinion that um, Duns Scotus is, 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 is an unappreciated genius of the Middle Ages. I mean, Thomas Aquinas was absolutely brilliant, but Duns Scotus, um, because he's too subtle, it's hard to appreciate um, how um, fascinating is his way of achieving comprehension of difficult uh, philosophical and theological matters. Um, what I could say for sure is um, Scotus uh, is, uh, if, you, if, you, if you get to approach uh, at some point Scotus's writings, you'll find that he, he puts you, he describes a problem, describes this different difficulties that emerge in dealing with that problem. And, um, and, and it, it gives you the gives you a feeling of um, being in, at the end of a crossroads or something like um, a cul-de-sac or something like that. Something uh, you, you, you're left in, in, in a situation, in an impossible situation. And then, I, I, that's why I think he's too brilliant. Um, then he'll, he'll come up with a distinction that will help you to solve that apparently impossible situation. So that's, that's, that's why he is so uh, well known in the history of philosophy as this doc, subtle doctor, because he has this ability to, 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 to come up with, with fascinating distinctions that seem to, seem to take us out of, of difficult, really difficult conceptual situations. That's a little bit about himself. Um, 
we know little about his own life. Um, um, well, we know enough to, uh, to, to, to realize that he was, um, he was very well appreciated in his own time. It was probably two generations after um, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, so, so all philosophy, at least in the Franciscan tradition after Duns Scotus, is going to be uh, deeply influenced by his thought. Uh, but of course, um, then, as John Daly puts it really nicely, um, another Franciscan, <laughs> William of Ockham, is going to stain this reputation of Scotus um, by defending an, an extreme sort of nominalism that will actually, well, historically will, will contribute to the discrediting of the realist tradition. And this is one of the worries, uh, of course, that Peirce has in, in, in the 19th century. He wants to help to dispel all these mis misunderstandings of the medieval tradition by showing that nominalism is actually an untenable position anyway but coming back to Duns Scotus, well we have a, a little uh, a little image here of Duns Scotus lecturing uh, and as you might well is with his Franciscan habit and and below you can see not only another Franciscan but a fellow Dominican etc cetera, etc cetera, just showing that this apparent um, opposition and between Franciscans and Dominicans, uh, Thomist and Scottist, Scottist philosophers, is only um, is a friendly rivalry, and we will say that you know they're working for the same cause, which is the realist cause. It, it, it's going to be William of Ockham, the one that actually sort of unleashed the real opposition of medieval philosophy. But this dialogue between schools was very fruitful. Um, and, and, and we could find people who were very, sim well, many, many uh, Dominicans who were more inclined to, to, to be, um, to, 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 to uh, adopt Francis the Franciscan tradition and the other way around. Some, some, some Franciscans that were more um, keen to adopt the Dominican uh, to Thomist uh, uh, tradition. So um, there was a, a, indeed, there was a friendly rivalry between schools, but actually there was a, there was a very fruitful interaction between the two schools. Um, so, um, but having said that, the real discrediting of the medieval tradition, particularly Dulce Scotus, was due to William of Ockham and, and, and the, and, and, and the subsequent tradition of uh, nominalist philosophers. And so much so that even in the English language, um, you, you might have, well, I don't know if you know this, but sometimes uh, to say that somebody's a fool, uh, they, 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 they put a, a little hat, <laughs> a cone hat on them, and they call them dunces. <laughs> and these, <laughs> actually, these are, of this offensive use of the use of the term dunes comes to comes to as a mockery of the scholars of dunes scotus. So it's a way of saying that if you follow dunes scotus, you are a fool. You know that 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 far we have this uh, development of the tradition, especially and this develop of the of the, the modern philosophies particularly. Well, okay, let's get into our issue proper. Um, so what, is, what I'm trying to present here is going to be uh, uh, the metaphysical uh, contribution of Duns Scotus uh, in a very ample way. And the purpose of it is to show you what is his theory of universals, what is his theory of reality. And from there, we'll, we'll, we'll understand to, um, the distinction that concerns us um, in a very useful way, which is going to be the distinction of modes of being and modes of signification. Okay, so Scotus' theory of universals is not only a theory of about the issue of whether universals exist or not. No, like well, but let me say maybe some of you might not be familiar with these philosophical distinctions between universals, particulars, and individuals. 
Okay, so I'm going to explore that first. If um, let's consider, for example, um, two objects that share some property. Okay, so for example, some characteristic. So for example, I have a hat here. Hopefully, the 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 illumination is good, and you can appreciate what color is 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 um is brown. And I have this uh, notepad here that is also brown, okay? So there's a common characteristic, there's a common uh, feature, there's a common property of these objects. And we could say is the, is, the, is, is the property of being brown. Of course, two different shades of brown, two different kinds of brown. But of course, we could say that these two objects, for example, are closer to each other in color than these other two objects. And I have another hat here that is green <laughs> and, and the brown one. So this is interesting now because look, we have three objects here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm populating your, your, your screen with, with objects, but this object is a brown notebook. This object is a brown hat and this object is a green <laughs> hat. So if I ask you, which ones are more similar to each other? In virtue of the form or the structure, you'll say the hats are closer to each other. They, 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 they fulfill the same function. Uh, and and the, the only, well, some of the one key difference is that they are different color. But of course, um, in terms of color, these two objects are closer to each other. But in terms of function, function and structure, they're very different. You know, like I couldn't use this notebook to, as a hat because it will fall down and, and it will be very bad to write on my hat. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay. So it's a silly explanation, but oh, bear with me. What I'm trying to say here is that different objects share common properties. And it depends on the eye of the beholder what property is relevant for comparing things. Of course, if, if the crit criterion is the color, of course, these two things are closer to each other, but if the criterion is the structure, the, the, the two objects are closer in this way. Um, the two points of comparison that we in which we find similarities between these objects is that um, objects are, they share properties and they share some properties that seem to be essential to their definition of their or their being. For example, the property of being made of paper is a key essential property for this notebook or notepad. Instead, the, the property of being wool, um, being made of wool, is a key um, property of this hat, as opposed to the property of being green. So, as you might see, um, there's a different um, hierarchy of instantiations of different properties. For example, my, my, my coat is green, uh, but that doesn't make it um, for an essential property for being a coat. Um, but maybe having, um, having uh, the structure that it has is, is necessary for it. So some properties are more essential than others. And of course, uh, Aristotle's, um, Aristotle's great insight in the history of philosophy was to realize that in order to know reality, we need to um, categorize all the, all the items that we can find in reality, not only physical items, but also conceptual items, abstract items, um, living items, complex items, simple items, um, all of them, and, and, and the category that help us, helps us to, in which everything falls is the category of being. Uh, and is, um, Aristotle says to us in Metaphysics, Metaphysics uh, Book One, uh, Paragraph One, says, uh, being is set in different modes. Being is said in different ways. Uh, and that's a key realization of Aristotle. Actually, the medievals interpreted that, um, all the medieval scholastics interpreted that Aristotle was onto something very important here by establishing different 
theories of modes of being. In other words, saying what is universal to every aspect of any item of reality. Okay, so what's a universal? It's a property that is shared by different uh, beings. And what's a particular? A particular is an object that falls into a property with another object. For example, we have two particulars of the concept of hat here, okay? But of course, um, there's a way in which this hat is different to this one. And when we talk about the difference between one particular and another particular, we talk about individuals. So cut the long story short, what do we get from this? We get that in order to understand reality, by and large, in its all, in its interacting complexity, we need two sets of principles, principles to understand the things that share, uh, share properties, which is universals. And these are, and, and, and from this one principle emerges that was the concern of Duns and Scotus, and it was the principle of universalization. And on the other hand, we need also principles to understand how particular objects get their individual identity. And this is, a, this is called the principle of individuation. All metaphysics, and at least in the medievals, uh, was composed of this interaction of two principles, the principle of universalization and the principle of individuation. And if you see where I'm going now, probably you'll start realizing that what Scotus is providing us is different ways of talking about signs and things, okay? So um, for example, the word red, so, or the word brown, color, brown color, helps us to, to, um, to talk about this object, but in some way, in a universal way. But if I wanted to talk about that, object in particular, I'll have to create a sign that only accounts for that object. Okay, so what Scotus did in metaphysics was to provide us a version of Aristotelianism, of metaphysics, uh, that accounts for things that are in reality. And funny, just, uh, just in brackets, it's important for you to know that even the word reality was invented by Duns and Scotes. Funnily enough, it's a word in diminutive. Uh, it comes from the word re. Re means a, a thing. Um, but reality is that that underlies everything that has the property of being. So when Scotus talks about reality, he talks about anything that shares the, 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 the property of being. Um, but what, what theory of reality is Duns and Scotus proposed to us? Well, the theory that he proposed to us uh, is, um, has these different concepts. The concept of common nature, um, the concept of a numerical unity and the concept of property. Okay, so universals are these shared properties between different items of reality, but uh, what they express when we talk about a universal, Scotus tells us that what we express by the universal, the sign of a thing that is universal in our mind is an item that is independent of us and is a connection that is, is, is real in virtue, in virtue of a common nature between things. So uh, let me try to explain this. So um, Scotus, in short, is trying to tell us that universals are real because they are based in a real common nature shared between things, but they only exist in our minds. So um, exist 
And here we have an important distinction to make, reality and existence. What's reality? The property of, of having some being. And what's existence? Existence is that this being is manifested in a way. So, and some of you that might be familiar with purse probably uh, are thinking in purse's categories. And of course, yes, this is exactly what Peirce meant uh, when, when he made the distinction that universe, for example, Peirce says that uh, God does, is not, does not exist because it's not being manifested at the moment to my mind, but God is certainly real because his reality, is in the, his being is independent of what I want to think about him or her. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, uh, so what we talk about, when we talk about reality, what we talk is probably what Peirce will call some kind of um, interaction between firstness and, and thirdness. And when we talk about uh, existence, we're talking about the manifestation, the reaction of that to a consciousness being that interprets that being and is called uh, secondness, of course. So it's kind of existence will correspond to secondness and reality will correspond to thirdness and firstness in different ways. Um, Peirce took all of this, is my, my hypothesis in this book, is that Peirce took all this scotus as material and rearranged it to help us understand how a semiotic understanding of reality will work out. Okay, so, so sorry about the really long introduction, but the, the point of, of this was to help us to come up to this important distinction that Peirce will adopt from Duns Scotus, that is that reality is everything that has being and existence is everything that is manifest manif is the is the manifestation of that being to a consciousness or to somebody who can interpret that being so okay so what what where are we getting at well we're getting at what will be the hinge point between that reality and its existence to my consciousness well a sign, a sign will be the, the medium that will, will help us to in, uh, hinge and connect and find the continuity between properties and how the different beings have them. You know, how do we, how do we um, identify that? By interpreting signs and things. And of course, this is a, a very sort of a general claim, but it's very important because what we're trying to say is that every mode of being of reality is pervaded by modes of signification. Uh, of course, um, like, like every semiotician will know, and, and, and as we know, uh, the great insight of Augustine that we were hearing yesterday is to realizing that for something to be a sign, it has to be able to be interpreted by somebody. There has to be an interpreter of that interpretant, okay? So that interpretant is there in virtue of reality, but exists in the mind of who interprets. So existence, uh, universals exist in us as signs of those common natures that are realities. This is one of the really key um, insights of Duns's Scotus. And one interesting thing that comes out of it is that um, Scotus um, explains us that there is a, a, a unity between things that is previous to numerical unity. Um, and that's, the, that's the, probably the great problem of nominalism, that nominalism conflates or collapses uh, the, sen the different senses of the word unity. Um, for a nominalist, for example, unity is only a matter of numerical unity. So, for example, between this, again with the hats, but 
the mad hatter you can call me. Uh, but uh, the point here is that for a nominalist, these objects are completely different because this is numerically one and this is numerically another unity. So there's no, there's no way of relating them in, in my experience, according to the nominalist. But a realist will tell you, of course, they are numerically different. They're two different objects. They're two different objects, but they are connected by a common nature. And that common nature unifies them in ways that are uh, previous to numerical unity. So for example, the very fact that you have a sign, a common sign for them both, which is the word hat, or flat cap, <laughs> depending on where you are. If you are in Ireland or in north of England, you'll call it flat cap. <laughs> um, so uh, that that sign is a unity, a continuity between the beings of the two objects uh, that is previous to numeric. Another example will be humanity. You know, we all. All the people who is participating in this in this uh, seminar today are human beings, but of course, uh, there doesn't there's a there's a unity that underlies our identity. If, if, if because if I wasn't a human, well, you probably will say. Uh, Maybe you are a computer program that resembles a human being. <laughs> uh, but no, no, I'm actually, I assure you, I'm real. <laughs> I'm a human being. Uh, and of course, you could say, oh, well, uh, okay, so Paniel, I eat me, <laughs> it's a human being. Uh, and that is a condition, a sufficient condition to understand why are we able to interpret him as somebody trying to say something intelligible. So that unity, that continuity, that in, in person's word, synechism between us, allows us to interpret each other in our own identity. So we have to presuppose that we are humans because that way we can presuppose that we can articulate our, our ideas with languages or our signs with languages. And, and of course that follows um, that we ultimately know that there's a different identity in each of us, which is a, a numerical unity that is defined by our own uh, aspects of, of a particular being. Okay. I hope it, this is not getting too complicated, but the, the idea is actually quite simple, that there's a common unity to all reality and is being. But that common unity to all reality has different levels of common natures. And those common natures become di differentiated in every individual in different ways. So um, when we talk about what things are um, existent, we're talking about a contract, a, 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 a way of reading a particular being, an individual being, in what is proper to that being for being who is or what is. And, and those aspects of that reality that depend on, on continuities with the, with the rest of reality. So this is nice because what Scotus is telling us is that there is a sense in which I am connected to everything else. And there is a sense in which I am a being that is connected to every other being. But there is a sense in which I am unique. And that uniqueness of me is my existence. Um, but my existence is, is, is a manifestation of different realities and how they interact in my own identity. So that particular way of being myself is what Scotus calls disness or hexate. And what connects me with the rest of reality in different ways is the common nature or the universals as I understand it. So this is very interesting because it helps us 
to understand the logic of science. And remember that it was Peirce who said to us that semiotics has to be a rigorous science of science, as opposed to um, semiology, which is a psychological interpretation of how different science can work and how different cultures understand them, et cetera, et cetera. But there is not a, rig a rigorous uh, core to it. And over here, uh, it's actually, we have, we're trying to discover what's the ultimate grounding of the sign relation. What's the metaphysics of a sign, okay? And the metaphysics of a sign is actually based on this, on this general theory of reality. And in this general theory of reality, we are starting to discover that are, there are signs that are universal. And there are signs that are uh, um, individual. One last example to illustrate this. And sorry, I'm eating away the time so quickly. <laughs> I get a bit excited with these things. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, but what I'm trying to say is think about a sign uh, like a name, okay? Think about, for example, the sign Robert. We have our, our very good friend Robert here, uh, very attentive. And when we talk about Robert, of course we talk about um, a sign of a human being. So in order to define that sign, it's essential for Robert to be to be um, to be a human being. Uh, for example, some property that Robert has, but he could, he could maybe not have, and it wouldn't make it a different, make him a different Robert, is to have a long beard, for example. Well, he has a short beard at the moment, but if he had a long beard, <laughs> will he be less himself to be a different Robert? No, because it's not essential property. So. A very important sign for Robert is a, a, a property that relates him to a universal, to a universal sign that helps us to understand him, to interpret him correctly. And it has to be the most essential properties that he has. And one of the most essential properties to understand who Robert is, is the universal of being a human being. Okay, human being. Um, but now, uh, that's not the only thing we need to understand about Robert. Then we start interacting with Robert and we realize that humanity cannot be in any other way um, instantiated in other, in, in, but in Robert, the way is instantiated in Robert. Okay, uh, let me try to explain that. So there's a way in which Robert expresses humanity that nobody else can express it. And that goes beyond his, own, his DNA, his genome. That goes beyond every, his fingerprint, et cetera, et cetera. We can try to find material characteristics in which Robert is unique, but they're, they're, they're good, they're good candidates, but actually more than matter, what we have to understand is the way of being of Robert that helps us to understand that he's unique. And that uniqueness of Robert is what Scotus calls hexate. His business, his own, his... And in other words, this gives us a very important semiotic ground. There is, a, and, and let me go to that, jump to that conclusion now, is that Robert is the sign by which Robert uh, uh, signifies what is unique about him. Paniel is a sign of Paniel. Paniel is a sign of himself because he is the only way that Paniel can signify what Paniel means. Of course, I need, in order to understand what Paniel means, you need to understand what is a human being, what is, etc. 
and some other characteristics. Uh, but it's not, but, but actually there's a sign of myself that only represents myself. Uh, so this is fascinating in many ways, but one of the important ways that Dulce's Cotus, at least from the point of view of metaphysics, drags from me, is that if, if I was to be lost, you know, if I was to disappear, um, um, there will be a loss for the world because the loss will have less meaning. Why? Because there's not, not going to be any other being that could represent what I, that could signify what I signify, which, i.e. myself, my own contribution to reality. And each of us is unique and is a unique contribution to the semiotic sphere because it represents its own mode of being that is unique in order to the world to be a richer place of, of interpretation. So um, it was a long, long um, introduction to this, but what we want to say is that hexaity is the name or the, or the metaphysical concept that Duntas Cotus is gonna provide us with in order to help us to understand how there is things, in, individuals are absolutely unique, but that uniqueness, that uni uniqueness is, is part of a unity with the rest of reality. It's a nice articulation of two things. On the one hand, the connection with everything else. But on the other hand, I don't want to disappear in, every, in the connection with the rest of the universe. I want, to be, I want to preserve my unity and preserve that unity by its own configuration. Leibniz, the German philosopher, modern German philosopher will express this, Scotus, this idea from Scotus saying that every monad, every being is a reflection of the rest of the universe that is unique. And it's, it's a semiotic um, definition actually because every monad is a sign that reflects the rest of the universe in a particular way. Well, that's what Scotus tries to say to us through hexaity. Hexaity and, and common nature interact in such a way that we are connected to the rest of the universe by being a sign of the universe, but at the same time, we are unique. Uh, there are competing theories of the principle of individuation in other medievals. For example, Henry of Ghent, who was a contemporary of Duns Scotus, believed that negation was important to define a, a, a being. Um, Thomas Aquinas, for example, um, proposed the concept of designated matter. And there's different alternatives, but I really like Duns Scotus because his concept of hexaity is the most um, adequate one to understand the universe in terms of science. I had an argument here to defend hexaity between, um, amongst other ways of uh, individual, uh, of proposing principles of individuation, but I don't want to delve on, on them. I just want to jump to some conclusions so far because um, <laughs> I'm realizing the time is running really fast. So, uh, but, uh, let me draw some partial conclusions here. A structures, for example, are universals, but not all to it. The simplifications or instantiation have a singular character. So we share a common nature that we call the universal, but we share them in a particular way, and that's our hexaity. And that hexaity we, uh, is the principle of individuation that we need. Also, it's important to say that Scotus's concept of individuation, uh, uh, don't worry about the time. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, what did I do there? Uh, okay, so, um, so one of the things I want to say to you is that this interesting metaphysical account also allows um, accounting for vagueness. This is important um, for Peirce, for example, was very important when, when he used the scotus because vagueness is a mode of being. 
I mean, there's real chance in the world, what he called dikeism. And signs don't have always to be uh, signs of something specific. They can be signs of things that are hard to understand or hard to know. Um, and another thing that allows is um, what Peirce called synergism or continuity. Um, which is that we are connected with the rest of the universe by, uh, and, and that connection is our common nature of being. And, and the most important thing for the history of semiotics that I want to bring up now is that signs are modes of signification that express modes of being, okay? So here, well, we are along the way thinking with, with Duns Scotus, so I thought it would be nice to put a, 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 a little picture there <laughs> of Duns Scotus hard, thinking hard about, um, thinking and writing hard about these issues. But let's, let's come back to what specifically Scotus said about science, okay? So I had some quotations that I actually, um, take from John Dilley's uh, great book, um, the, let me remember what's the name of our book. Um, give me one second. I'm just going to have to exit it. For some reason, I cannot exit my presentation. Okay. Sorry about that. Maybe. Okay, give me one sec. <laughs> ah, okay. Just wanted to get the quotation right. Is medieval philosophy redefined as the Latin age, the development of xenoscopic science? It's a great book. I really, I really enjoyed that book. It's a very big book by John Dilly. And I think um, that book uh, has, I mean, it's, it's a book that will give us a lot to talk about in the future. So that's, that's very nice um, that we can have that legacy from John Dilley. But one of the things that John said there, and that I was, I was really thankful to have little brief discussion with him at the first centennial conference in Lowell, Massachusetts in 2014. Um, that was my only one claim to interact with John Dilley. But um, we, we had a little chat and he seemed very keen to um, tell us that um, basically uh, the medievals, uh, this great scholastics like Dun Scotus, Thomas Aquinas, Roger Bacon, they're some important middle point between the great insight of St. Augustine and the even greater insight of John Point, Point Sot, right? Uh, but actually, uh, let me, allow me to um, differ with John Dilly there, because John Dilly says over there that, um, that Duns Scotus' account of science is actually just, just, completely derivative of what Roger Bacon had to say about Augustine's, uh, the Sacra Doctrine, and some of the things that uh, Augustine says in the Magister or, the, or with the, on the teacher, uh, that we actually, a great, great contribution to the history of semiotics that we saw yesterday. Uh, I, um, and I really enjoyed the thought yesterday, but, um, but, but I, I did, I have a different opinion here because I think what Scotus has to say in terms of science might seem derivative of what uh, Roger Bacon said. And Roger Bacon's proposal on science is kind of limited to science uh, of language, which is particularly words. Um, but I, I, I have a different opinion on that because it is true. Scotus doesn't have a, a Theatres as such on science. But what he provides us with is a, 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 the metaphysical 
uh, background that is necessary for a for for the for a for a for a, an interpretation of the whole of reality as signs as a, as a, as a semiosphere uh, as a as a universe of signs and that's why I think it's very important in that sense and that's why I think Perez will agree with me <laughs> saying that that's why Scotus was his favorite philosopher of the medievals and of all times actually. And why? Because he provided him of that insight that was necessary in order to develop the rigorous science of science as a rigorous science of um, logic and of every aspect of reality and so like understanding the world as a semi-sphere. Okay, what is called to say specifically? Let me, let me quote him. To signify is to represent something to the understanding. What therefore is signified is the object conceived by the understanding. But whatever is conceived by the understanding is conceived under some distinct and determinate rationale. Because understanding is a kind of act. And accordingly, the mind distinguishes what it understands from something else. Everything that is signified, therefore, is signified under the distinct and determinate rationale. In other words, and of course, the way John reads this is in terms of what is specifically and exclusively what he says here, which is, of course, every sign is a particular sign because it has a particular meaning. And it doesn't seem like a great thing to say in order to define science. But if you look at this against the background of the metaphysics, it's a very powerful thing to say. Why? Because in the first place, the mind occupies a position that defines the mind in terms of its activity, not in terms of, of a mysterious entity. Like, for example, in Platonic philosophy or in nominalistic philosophy, the mind is some kind of thing that is there, but it's really hard to explain because it's not a thing that can be seen. It's not a thing that can be um, interacted with physically, et cetera, et cetera. And every reductionism will have troubles understanding the mind. But here, what Scotus is telling to us is that every every item, every being that is able to interpret another thing, another reality, is a mind. So mind is defined by the interpreting power of giving a particular meaning to a reality or to a being. And this is um, very powerful because what is a sign? Well, a sign is something that connects the universe with a mind. And the universe itself, by interpreting its own realities, is a mind interpret interpreting another mind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when, when you're trying to understand the obscure language I'm using, you are a mind that is aware of other minds and other realities. And, and this is very powerful because it, it helps us against any kind of solipsism that nominalism will take us. Remember, if you remember your history of philosophy, Descartes is quite famous because he um, cast this challenge of trying to demonstrate that your mind is not the only reality that there is, you know? For example, it was, and of course, well, you, we know that how Peirce and others have criticized this idea, but, but the key point here is that this idea that the mind is isolated from the universe, you know, how do we know you're not, how do you know how William can know uh, is he's not dreaming, you know, he's still in his bed and, um, and he's dreaming about the talk of Paniel that actually hasn't happened yet. I'm, I'm, I'm a figment of your imagination, William. How, do you, how will you be able to tell if I'm real or not? 
And this is kind of the Cartesian challenge, right? They're like, how do you know that you're not in the matrix? <laughs> now that the matrix is again back in business. <laughs> how do you know you're not dreaming? How do you know that you are not um, the, pr the product of a evil genius like Descartes will, will tell us, or, or you're not a brain in a bag, like Hilary Putnam will put it. You know, these ex skeptic challenges are everywhere in the history of philosophy. But I think the key to answer to that problematic uh, um, position in philosophy, which is solipsism, is the use of science. It's a semiotic response to that. The, the Peirce, Wittgenstein, other philosophers of our more closer to us than Dutton Scotus had great arguments to explain this, but actually the insight is back there in the medievals, and is this. If you were the only reality in the universe, if your mind was the only reality and it was disconnected with, with other realities, you wouldn't be able to sign anything other than yourself. You know, because um, the presence of, you know, the very fact, and Wittgenstein's uh, position is, is this, um, you will then be able to learn a language because language presupposes correction and correction presupposes another mind that is different than yours. You know, if you didn't have an experience of mistaking, uh, of, of being mistaken in different ways, you will then realize that you are a self. So your own idea of being a self comes from your own idea of being a fallible being. And this fallibility is what defines us as sign users because we are correcting our signs every now and again. And if, if we were the only beings in the world, we, we couldn't be able to correct ourselves. We, we had to correct in virtue of experience, in virtue of other, of other minds that correct our signs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, a, it's very powerful evidence that we are not alone in our own minds. Um, why? Because otherwise there, will be, there wouldn't be any correction to our thoughts uh, coming from it. There wouldn't be uh, the, resistant, the, the resistance that experience offers to us, the reaction that experience offers to us. Okay. So another important thing that Scotus says about signs is that every, the interpretant, I mean, what is, what is in the, the, the interpretation um, that an interpreter captures is an entity or is, an, is, is, a, is a thing that is independent of us. That's another important thing that Scotus contributed and first recovered, for example, in his own account of semiotics. Another, I had a lot to say here, but, uh, but bear with me because I'm realizing I'm taking probably a bit too long now. Um, so another important thing is that um, it's Scotus helps us to understand that modes of signification, having a, a mind that interprets, uh, it's a key ground to understand modes of being how things are. How things are is a way of interpreting them. So when a mind interprets the world, is acting upon the world by modes of signification that uncover those modes of being. And this constitutes what, um, of course, in our time, we we more familiar with the rigorous science of semiotic, we call semiosphere. The universe is a semisphere. In other words, there's no things in themselves. Everything can be given a sign. And per se, in a really nice way, the, the, the absolutely incognizable is absolutely in, inconceivable. If there is something that cannot be uh, represented by a sign or signifi signified by a sign, it can. How can you talk about it? You're giving it a sign by talking about what is not subject under the signs. So what, what's the consequence of that? 
that everything is a sign in a way. Everything is part of the sign, universe of signs. Um, the reality of signs, the reality in a scot a scotistic sense, you know, signs have their own identity. And I had prepared for you um, a, a fragment of this book I wrote, um, which is called Ideas in Development, which is on Scotus' theory of logic. And it, it, my intention was to explain to you um, Scotus' own theory of signification, which probably was unfamiliar to um, important, you know, for example, John Dealey has a great, has a great, um, it's a great uh, ex exegetical um, study of points of, for example. Um, but but he misses um, a little bit of what Scotus has to say on signification. And I don't blame him because much of this material is just it's just been available very recently. It has been is a bit of is a bit sad that. Even up to this day, a lot of Scotus's writings are not easily available. So one of the things that Scotus say um, about signification, he proposes to us um, something quite similar, strikingly similar to Peirce's classification of signs. Remember that Peirce classifies signs in different ways and gives us a 60, 64, for example, core classification of signs. Um, of course, uh, from the point of view of the interpretant, uh, we have icons, indexes, and, and symbols, for example. And, and, uh, and, and then we have, and then unleashes all this kind of um, fascinating classification of signs. Well, Scotus has something slightly analog to this exercise, and it's called his theory of suppositio, appellatio, and copulatio, which is different ways of signification that are part of what he calls the supposition theory. And so it's the way in which we can signify things. It's fascinating. Unfortunately, um, we don't have the time to, to, to delve into that now. But uh, um, I hope to develop these ideas and hopefully um, you know, show them to you in an upcoming article. And, 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 and maybe if you have space for another talk in another time, I'll be, I'll be very happy to talk about this. But it's just, um, but the point I want to put across is that Scott has actually worked out um, a theory of, of science based on the acts of signification. Which is fascinating, okay. and it's also it, it's not technically called semiotics, but of course now that we understand the background of it, we understand it. It is a semiotics. So some conclusions, okay, and we finish this talk. Scotus account of reality provides the necessary metaphysical grounding for semiotics, and that was my my hypothesis is that Peirce was able to to develop his own semiotics because he, has the, he had the right view of reality, which is a, right, a good metaphysics, a scientific metaphysics, like Peirce liked to say. And it was, a, it was his, what he called his scholastic realism of a Scotus's strike. Of course, Peirce will say that he'll go beyond Scotus, and that's true, he went further than him. But the basis is here, and I think is, this is something that has, that has been unappreciated, actually, even from, from the, uh, 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 scholars of Peirce uh, themselves. Another key thing we said in this talk is that modes of being are expressed in modes of signification. That's, that's very interesting. And if we are able to, to capture that fascinating insight, we'll be able to capture the idea that um, thinking about using signs is interacting with the world, is, is an intellectual activity of connection with the rest of the universe. Um, the contribution of Duns Scotus to semiotics goes beyond what has been presented here for sure. I mean, I presented just a fragment, just, just, just a, a humble thesis. Well, 
and ambitious as well. <laughs> but thus far, we have appreciated that it was a key to Peirce's insight on the rigorous science of science. So um, if you allow me to say one last comment, um, I think John Daly was onto something like, uh, he, he really, really uh, realized that the scholastics were um, fascinatingly advanced for the time, especially in this great insight of the semiosphere and, it, and, and the semiotic nature of reality. Uh, but it wasn't only John Poinsot who gave us, <laughs> who gave us this, uh, this proposal. It's actually already germinally in Duncan Scotus, probably in Augustine as well, and, and, and previous philosophers and, 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 and thinkers, you know, we're not saying that is is a, a, a we're not claiming that it's just the Scotus who did this, uh, but 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 the Scotus's place in the history of semiotics, uh, I think I think has good has good uh, grounds to be reconsidered, and that's my proposal to you today and um, and this great seminar. Um, I feel very honored to be able to be participating here with you, and so I just want to say muito obrigado. All right, my, uh, I don't know if I can be seen here. Okay, there we go. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cardenas. That was uh, a wonderful presentation and um, we're really glad that you uh, shared those insights with us. Uh, I'd also like to thank everybody um, who's either here in the Zoom meeting or watching live or even those watching, um, after the presentation on the recording. So thank you guys for your time. And I do want to mention briefly before we uh, bring everything to a close that the next presentation is going to be uh, titled On the Genesis of Semiotics According to Algirdas Julian Gremas. And uh, please forgive me for probably butchering that name because I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, but that lecture will be delivered by uh, Dr. Ina Genadivna. Merkolova. Um, and that's going to be on January 22nd, which is this coming Saturday. So please check our auditorium page for, uh, for local times. So thank you everyone again, and hope to see you soon. And at this time, uh, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're going to close the broadcast, but we're going to invite uh, Dr. Cardenas to uh, stay a bit longer and answer any questions from the uh, audience uh, here at Zoom. Is that correct?